Hey guys, um, so we got Anton Lambers with us today. Uh, Anton is uh, one of the orthopedic trainees from Australia and um, this podcast uh, is a new series and we're going to talk about different things in life, especially for the medical students. Um, the Today's podcast will be more concerned about orthopedics and how as a student or as a trainee, uh, anyone who's interested in orthopedics can benefit. And some of the things we're going to discuss um, are uh, for students in general, you know, things that can help you as a student, things um, that has helped me and Anton over the years and things um, that we found useful. Uh, uh, and welcome. If you want to introduce us, um, yeah, you know, uh, about you, and then we'll go from there. Um, um, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm an orthopedic trainee in Melbourne, Victoria. Um, I'm very passionate about um, thinking about how we learn and how we remember things. Um, I um, use a lot of notes and sort of um, spaced repetition flashcards and things in med school, and um, I now work on developing that sort of software for orthoboards, and I use that stuff. For my own learning um, as well so happy to talk about any of that and hopefully some of this will help some of you to study better and more effectively and do less ineffective techniques. Anton, um, when you talk about orthopedics what uh, resources do you find um, the most useful on a day-to-day -day basis? What are, you, what are you using the most in uh, orthopedic uh, learning? Uh, I know a lot of students know about auto bullets, but uh, what what, how, what do you think of auto bullets and what other resources can you recommend? Yeah, yeah, big big question. Big question. It definitely depends on what stage, you're, stage at you're at of your own learning pathway, um, and probably can talk about lots about what you can do on auto bullets separately. But I think if you're a medical student, I think things like auto bullets or med bullets, if you're interested, uh, good ways of getting concise information um, is in the highlight reel. Um, if you're a registrar, particularly a junior registrar, I think you probably want to look at multiple different parts of things. So if you're preparing for a list, for example, for a theatre list, um, I really like to look up the approach, the, um, the operation technique, and then the equipment um, technique guides. Because so across those things, you're probably more likely to understand your operations. So, uh, for approach, I think... Um, Hoppenfelds is probably a good text. Um, that's what we use and it's on that orthopedic sort of prescription when you're sitting exams. Um, and that's like an atlas of orthopedic approaches and it's got focused anatomy in there as well. Um, practical point of view, day-to-day, -day, I use 3D4 medical systems um, essential anatomy or complete anatomy app um, on my phone. That's on, also on your laptop and on your iPad. Um, and that's a 3D interactive um, skeleton that you can onlay um, neurovascular structures, muscle structures, um, tells you about their insertions, origins, innovation, and it helps me understand approaches a little better. You can also section parts of the body there and look at uh, cross-sectional anatomy. So um, I would use that looking at how I'm going to get to a part of the body, particularly if it's an unfamiliar approach. Looking at the actual surgical technique, I think um, if you're a trainee or, or advanced unaccredited registrar, I think Weasels is probably a good text. That's um, W-I-E-S-E-L-S. Um, that's sort of an operative techniques textbook. There's also Campbell's, which is a lot bigger, has a lot more information. Um, and then your usual things like Autobullets has technique guides. You have ViewMedi, which has orthopedic videos. Um, I think if you put those things together, you'll, you'll have a good handle on how to do operations. And then always, always look up the PDF surgical technique for the implant that's being used. So particularly for arthroplasty, you know, what combinations are possible. Um, and then for any other trauma, looking at what screws and drills need to be used and um, the surgical steps because often the PDF will have a lot more information um, and it can be a lifesaver in surgery if you, if you know that information. Yeah, so I think learning in general, everyone says work out what works for you. A lot of people tend to do what's worked for them in the past and what I'm always trying to challenge is whether or not what I've done in the past is the most effective and efficient way to learn because as you get further along, you have less and less free time to um, spend on studying, particularly once you have a family or you've got exams and you've got longer working hours after medical school. So in medical school, I was very much a note taker, highlighter. Um, I'd write volumes and summaries of lectures. And yeah. things I'm not sure and if that, sure was, if that effective. was effective. It's good because, it's good because you requires you to, requires take, you to take the information in, process it, and then um, output it in a different format. And that can be helpful um, because it, I guess, is a way of making you use the information, manipulate it, and that process helps you learn it. But it's very time-consuming. 
Um, when I started orthopedic training, um, I just defaulted to doing a similar thing. I, I moved from paper notes to electronic notes. Um, I initially used Evernote, which is a good note-taking system, uh, and then I moved to OneNote because my study group was using that and I could share the notes. Um, and probably in the last year or so, I've realized that that process and the time taken to summarize everything and put it in there was not that effective in helping me learn it, um, and it was very time-consuming. So um, I've, at the advice of a friend of mine, Adrian Talia, um, he basically said, let's focus on doing things that help us learn uh, rather than collate information. And the hierarchy for me of learning information is reading it, is probably the easiest things we can read things very easily without understanding it um i think writing it down is probably the next level up um, i think speaking it out loud is probably the level up above that and then teaching it is sort of the prime so um we've moved now to a system where we routinely um speak or do recall like active recall to each other um we don't write any notes um and we try to um you know, briefly read and then relay and teach to each other because I think it's all well and good to think you've learned something by reading it, but until you articulate it out loud, you're not really sure how much you've you've collected and that really is a fine way, I think, of organising your knowledge. The spaced repetition learning is a whole other um, area of learning. It's the whole, I think they're called the Eddinghouse theory, where you have decay of knowledge after the first time that you're presented with it. And so mass learning is when you read a textbook and you try and stick it all in and half of it falls out um, and there's a half-life of retention of that information. And spatial repetition learning is that you're presented with small chunks of facts, you're represented those facts just before you forget them and that boosts you up in your recall and that then spaces out in longer intervals. And if you're getting those things wrong, they come up earlier and if you're getting right, they come up later on. And therefore, you spend your time learning the things you know less about and you don't spend time revising things you've already learned. Um, and I think that's the future of learning. I think that's the most effective way to do it. And people have been using that for languages. And um, there's algorithms written into Duolingo and Anki and Quizlet and Brainscape. And um, I think that's going to be the, the future of learning. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. I've uh, used some of this stuff uh, um, during my preparation in the recent exams. I really find this interesting and uh, I think it really, really helps, especially the space reputation. Um, you know, once you uh, mark out these are the important things and those are the things you focus upon when you are revising back, that really uh, just, uh, you know, drastically changes it. Uh, obviously, that's something that um, needs a fair bit of research. Uh, or maybe a small project looking at space repetition uh, versus people who use the conventional methods for learning and then uh, you know see if there's any massive dif any difference or not so um, I totally agree these are some of the methods that I have used personally and I think are absolutely fantastic uh, um, eventually I think uh, every student is different every person is different uh, uh, there are thousand of ways how to learn things and how to go about things but um, it all depends on a personal level you know what suits you something might suit me and Anton but uh, something might not suit the other person so uh, in the end it's all uh, individual and personalized um, now just a little bit off track um, you know let's uh, why don't we just talk about something about uh, your hobbies in general and life um, you know, outside orthopedics because it's very, very interesting. Uh, uh, so what are your hobbies, Anton? What, what do you do uh, when you have spare time, vacations, you know, um, all this stuff? Yeah, so uh, number one, try and spend as much time as I can with my wife, um, who's pregnant at the moment, which is exciting. Um, the We like traveling, so we don't love traveling. Um, my biggest sports passion is probably orthopedic, uh, not orthopedics, I'm um, skiing. Um, and yeah, I work um, on a voluntary basis at um, a ski patrol association at Mount Hoffman in Victoria and um, do some days there every year, which is sort of like search and rescue and first aid on the snow. Um, and I do some sort of um, snow type holidays. Um, we went to Kashmir a couple of years ago um, and with a group of friends went to Antarctica for like a sort of ski touring trip um, last year. So we had a big trip planned for Alaska this coming year, but um, that's been canned because of coronavirus. And, my brothers and I are kayaking instead of doing a big kayaking sort of expedition over Christmas. Um, fantastic. Um, 
So I think it's the hi highlight of this is that it's very important to have some hobbies. It's very important to balance uh, your work and personal life uh, because being a doctor, be being, being a, a registrar, you know, long hours can be taxing and you need to relax a bit. You need to have something to uh, just wind down a bit, just to uh, relax, just, just to get that breather, um, you know, just just uh, to do something that take, takes away from your uh, work and uh, just, uh, just some that special one hour, two hour with the family, with the kids can um, just freshen your day. Just can uh, uh, that that happens with me. I spend a few hours with my kids and then go back to work the next day, and then the stress seems to be just gone. Um, so that's that's the whole point of talking about this stuff. Is that you know whichever field you guys are working in, whichever where, wherever. Uh, department you work in you need to have some sort of a balance where you take time for your family for your kids where you uh, have an activity that you like you want to do uh, you go out and make sure you have time for that stuff yeah, yeah. i think um as far as that's going to be, point definitely, you definitely have been enjoying um playing a bit with uh, mindfulness meditation my wife got me onto that a few years ago and i've been using an app called headspace which is like a very fairly cheap subscription um, it has sort of guided meditation things um, which have been really effective in sort of recognising when you're stressed. I think that's one of the hardest parts about being an orthopedic or you know, any sort of medical um, staff member is when, when the tough gets going, you, you kind of just keep pushing and you get into sort of um, you know, sympathetic response where you're just working and working, but you don't really have much insight into how you're um, feeling, um, whether you're tired, whether you're stressed. Um, you kind of just push and push and, and survive, and I think, that certainly helped me to recognize moments when I'm feeling stressed and when I'm not stressed. And um, it gives you te active techniques that you can use to sort of ma manage that. So it's something else I've found helpful, uh, but it's hard to do. The first month is bloody hard when you're, um, when you're sort of you have an active mind and, and you're used to doing stuff, just taking time to settle down and, and slow yourself can be really challenging and, and frustrating for the first little while. Uh, yeah, that's so true, mate. Um, absolutely. Um, Mindfulness, uh, so just talk a little bit about mindfulness since we've started talking about Headspace and stuff. So obviously there are many apps uh, uh, that are there. Now apart from using those apps, is there any specific guided meditation that you're doing? Or uh, you think that's something that uh, you know doctors or the registrars should go into and look into doing? Um, uh, do you believe meditation really helps? Has it helped you? Yeah, oh, definitely. definitely. Yeah, um, I started doing when I was doing a um, a Kajen Surge trauma job, which is like reasonably busy um, and stressful. And yeah, it definitely helped me. It helps me to understand when I'm feeling stressed, and um, yeah, gives you tools to work on it. I think it's definitely effective. It takes a lot of patience and commitment to sort of keep at it, but you can do sort of you can limit your sessions to just being five minutes a day, um, build it in as part of your routine. Um, it can be incredibly effective, I think. Yeah, I think on the, on the topic of um, how I learn now, I've, I've recently, I, I was initially taking my Evernote um, summaries, putting them into Anki, then making flashcards and then using that. And that whole process was so time consuming that I wasn't keeping up with my um, curriculum that I wanted to keep up with. Um, and I've since learned that in author boards, they've developed a space repetition learning algorithm um, for their board style multi choice questions. Um, and I've actually started using their um, curriculums, which you can subscribe to and um, give these, um, they give you a curriculum basically of frequent um, topics to learn and then questions within those topics to cover. And with, when you do those questions, they actually go into a cycling uh, spaced repetition algorithm within author boards, uh, which will bring the questions back to you earlier if you got them wrong. So it's effectively doing an Anki and Quizlet and other programs have done in the past, but now it's all in the one place. Um, so I'm pretty confident that within the next year or two, um, Authorbulls is probably going to be, for most people, where they actually have their center, central storage of information, including notes, PDFs, um, flashcards, and questions, um, and it's sort of all going to be in the one place, is my suspicion, um, because it stops you from having to summarize information from multiple other sources, store it somewhere else, transfer it to another program um, in order to do your learning. So. I'm excited to see what happens in that space, and I know they're working on it. Um, the most exciting part, I think, is that they're working on a way from 
instead of at the moment when you're subscribed, you can write notes next to the topic pages um, as side notes. Um, in the next year or so, I suspect there'll be um, developments where you can actually add extra text um, within the paragraphs and on the topic pages themselves. So author books will become your skeleton for your notes and you're actually going to be able to build on them and you'll hear something from a teaching from a surgeon or you'll see something on a view medi video. You can actually be able to add and edit your own personalized copy of author board. So that's the most exciting thing I think I'm looking forward to because that's going to save me the most amount of time um, in my study preparation because I know a lot of my colleagues are copying and pasting author boards, putting it to somewhere else, putting it into flashcards. And synthesizing those together is going to be a massive advantage. Absolutely. There have been uh, multiple fantastic uh, resources that have come out. And uh, one of the other ones that I found really useful is Boomedi. I don't know how much you use Boomedi, but I think that's a fantastic video resource, especially the um, surgeons and the speakers in that are some of the, you know, the highest rated uh, orthopedic surgeons in the world. And you literally find every topic video surgical demonstration so that that's a resource that i re really uh, uh use um uh, if what what are your thoughts on Woomedi? yeah i think it's excellent i think it can be difficult to navigate it sometimes and the quality of the videos is variable um but it's an excellent way particularly for surgical technique um that you can actually you know see how things are done um learn from them and again there's some serious experts on there that have presented great things the other sort of um subscription-based curated version of viewmedi is orthoracle so o-r-t-h-o-r-a-c-l-e um that's a paid service but it's effectively like a um a deluxe viewmedi they're not always videos and often photos but they're high quality um for photograph surgeries with um ex descriptions of each step and the key um techniques i find that to be very useful um, and from an evidence um, evaluation point of view, um, I think it's called orthoevidence.com um, is another subscription service that you can use to digest vast amounts of literature, which is obviously getting pumped out every minute, um, which gives you summaries on topics and also summarizes papers for the quality of the evidence and interpretation of the results, which is good if you're someone who just wants to get to not have to think about um, all of the analysis. You can have some experience in that area, do that part for you. Okay. Um, I think uh, using these resources have really changed the way uh, we're learning uh, medicine now, and uh, uh, especially the surgical fields. Um, you know, we can we can more talk about orthopedics since we are in orthopedics. But um, I think all these resources are available in different forms for all all, all the branches, isn't it? So this has really changed the way uh, students are learning. Uh, um, you know, medicine now, uh, whereas if you look at 15 years ago when the YouTube wasn't as big, when internet wasn't as big, uh, it's really hard to, you know, uh, uh, get hold of these things. And, you know, until unless you're in the operating theater, uh, you literally basically don't have an exposure to the uh, surgeries per se. So uh, um, I, I think uh, good use and knowing which resources to use can make a drastic difference to your knowledge and experience and how you learn things. Yeah, I totally agree. I think making a habit of preparing for your work and using those resources and doing it in small steps frequently will exponentially increase your knowledge. And um, on the flip side is that at the end of the day, try and do some reflection about what you saw, um, how people have done things, um, take note of the tips and practical tricks, um, and you'll, you'll, you really will accelerate your learning um, trajectory because you're pre-preparing and then you're post-preparing and you're, you're taking as much as you can out of each clinical experience um, and you're more likely to remember more of it. Um, so recently we used a group study um, approach. Um, I did this with Adrian Talia um, for Victoria as well. We got about 10, 15 or so trainees across Western Australia, Victoria and New South Wales and did a test run, I suppose, of group um, resource uh, space to optician learning in preparing for a orthopedic exam. So each person was allocated with developing questions for certain parts of the examination. We pulled them together, sent them out as flashcard program um, uh, decks, and then each person, as they studied, the flashcard program was automatically recording their usage. And so we then were able to um, export, once the candidates got their exam results, is for the OPBS, the Orthopedic Basic Science Exam, 
Um, we were able to manipulate the data, look at how many hours they spent their patterns of study, um, and correlate that with their um, definite examination score. And we saw this beautiful, and this published in the Journal of Surgical Education at Flanders and Talia, um, 2020. Um, you can see a direct linear relationship between the number of hours spent using a spatial repetition learning algorithm and the final percentage score on this OPBS exam. We had a group of about, I think it was about 10 or 15 or so, um, and every single person that used the app passed the exam. So it was 100% pass rate. And that sitting had a 60% pass rate across the country. Um, so it's not an easy exam. Um, and most people learn use the app for around 20 hours or so, uh, 20 to 30 hours, um, and they're able to pass the exam. And for some people, that was the only um, study they did, and they didn't read entire textbooks and volumes. Um, but just by learning through simulated questions and reading around the answers to those questions um, and using an active recall approach to learning, um, I, I believe people were able to retain more. And that was why we had such a high pass rate in that group. That's fantastic, Anton. Um, I'm I'm pretty sure uh, you know really looking at uh, these uh, uh, new modalities of learning and actually assessing how um, yeah that that's something we were talking in the early part of the podcast that we once we start looking into how these things really affect so just like the study that you have done uh, you can really say look these are the methods that have been proven to be effective and these are generic methods that can be applied all across the board whatever student you are um, whatever field you're studying in um, this i think these are fantastic resources you just need to learn to use them apply them once you get going you will see the results yeah i think the the other interesting sort of i guess frontier of learning um from a skill point of view is probably virtual reality training um and i think that's um coming to us as, as trainees in the near future and we had um, I was involved with setting up one of the virtual reality um, centres last year at, at the Austin Hospital in Victoria. Um, and the stuff that you can do in that space is phenomenal. And it's embedded into other training programs in Australia, particularly Ophthal, and it's definitely embedded into orthopedic systems in France and the US. And I think that's coming to us, and it's both for open and arthroscopic surgery. And the ability to train and become a what they call a pre-trained novice before you arrive in the operating theatre is going to absolutely increase our ability to um, perform um, and uh, it will speed up the process of training because we have we're starting from a higher set point and we've got opportunities to practice skills in between patient interactions. So um, that's something else that I'm quite interested in and looking forward to seeing develop in the future, um, as well as the technology developing because we're going from these bulky sort of haptic systems that involve laptops and and you know mechanical um, soft you know footprints like hardware footprints and now we're looking at things like the Oculus. Um, where you have just a headset and inside your headset you've got your internet access, your, your hardware, your software um, and all you have to do is have a couple of controllers. Um, and we demoed this last year and you can have a surgeon at home somewhere else jump into the same operating room as you virtually and take you through an anterior approach to a total hip or take you through um, positioning the cup in an acetabulum um, and I'm really excited to see where that goes because that's going to make it um, infinitely more accessible um, and you know the opportunities for teaching are going to be massive. Absolutely. I think uh, these are really, really interesting and uh, fascinating uh, things that have been uh, coming up. Um, it's, you know, combined with the virtual reality, the videos that are available, the, uh, the spatial repetitions that we've discussed, um, you, you know, these flashcards. So all these new modalities about five years ago uh, when I was a junior student, uh, you know, these things were not really there let's say 10 years let's go back uh, maybe 10 years ago these things were not there so the um, changes have been drastic i think every uh, few years uh, or especially a decade you see some dr uh, dramatic changes which happen and um, you know things that have been discovered are absolutely fascinating uh, um, and what about the note-taking system so i've i've used uh, you know just use my normal iphone for normal notes or sometimes i use uh, Evernote. Um, what do you use for note-taking systems? What's your take? What's your preferred method? And what do you find useful? Yeah, I think um, I've, I've tried most of them. <laughs> I can I moved around a bit, which is a bit annoying. But um, I, I started off medical school wise. I was I was pen and paper um, books. Um, you know, summarizing lectures and textbooks and writing little paper notes. Um, not very effective with the use of your time, unless that's particularly important for your learning. 
um, and also much more difficult to access and search your volumes of work you've done. You want to quickly look up, look something up. It's a lot more challenging, and then you're not keeping all these books and stuff at home. So I think electronic is probably the way to go moving forwards. Um, and there's so many options available to you. So you have um, things like Apple Notes. I'm an iPhone user, so Apple Notes I use. Um, it's not that great for I think taking extensive orthopedic notes if you want if you want to write summaries of topics and things. Um, but you can use it. I use it a lot for things like sharing notes with my wife um, and you know, shopping lists, um, passwords, um, anything, you know, taking notes about baby stuff that we've got to get sorted. Um, I think for summarizing things, if you're a summarizer and you, and you really want summaries of um, content, I think Evernote or OneNote are probably um, the, the two biggest ones you probably hear spoken about. I started off using Evernote. Um, it was a bit clunky opening it on the phone, I found. Um, but um, you know, it, it's definitely a, a leading sort of software. The beauty of it is you can write a lot of different formats. You can um, link, like I said before. So I'd have, um, for example, notes about how to do an operation, um, and I could have a hyperlink that links to my note on how to do an approach. So, um, for example, I could have a hip replacement note, and then they post your approach to the hip note, and they could link to each other if I want to flip back and look at the actual anatomy of the approach and then go back to the steps of the operation afterwards. Um, I found that to be helpful and I've done that also in OneNote because you have the same features um, drawing is important to me because if I see a cuff repair for the first time and it's like a double row arthroscopic cuff repair and there's you know, strings and portals flying everywhere um, I'm, I'm a big visual learner so I'll try and draw a picture of which portal was in where how they did, did, did each step and you can save those pretty easily into um, OneNote and Evernote and that technology is probably going to come coming to things like AuthorBullet from the future where you can put those pictures into your topic pages um, so I like all of them. I like that they hyperlink with OneNote, especially it's a lot easier to share with others in your study group. So you can have a combined note deck for your whole study group and you can all live edit um, the same pages, which is pretty impressive. Um, I found OneNote a bit better for opening up my phone and searching and um, you know using it on multiple devices, which I didn't find as easy with Evernote. And not that I love Microsoft. I find it, I think it's a bigger company. It's probably in my point of view, more trustworthy in the future as an investment of my time um, than Evernote, which is sort of a standalone note-taking um, application. Um, but lots of others out there as well. Um, they're the two that I'm familiar with, and that's how I use them. I also use OneNote as a um, the whole this whole second brain theory of where you don't spend energy trying to remember lots of things, and you have this second brain, which is a note-taking system um, to basically dump everything you have in your head. Um, so I take it, I use it for like I do either have about innovation that I'll work on the future. I use it for to-do lists of like things that I'll, I need to do. And instead of thinking about that, I just put them on, on a note and come back to it later. Um, and that's a technique I think people have developed that helps you concentrate on the present, uh, not think about what's due and what's outstanding, um, and eases the mental pressure of everything else you've got going on. So just dump some of the stuff on, on paper or a note somewhere and, and leave it. All right, so... Anton, you're in orthopedic training. Uh, could you could you tell the future orthopedics uh, wannabe uh, surgeons, the medical students, and the junior registrars and the RMOs who um, want to step up and want are considering uh, life, um, you know, considering orthopedics as a profession? Um, as how does how does getting into orthopedics work? How long it is, and what are the things you have to do? It obviously starts as an interest, um, and that happens late for some people and early for others. Um, and the reason for interest is so broad; it can be someone who has a good experience in like a pediatric or pedi clinic, and they decide, "I want to, I really want to get into ortho so I can treat kids with like um, deformities and contractors." Or it might be that you've come in for a trauma case as a med, you're male, and you think it's the coolest thing in the world to sort of percutaneously treat this crazy fracture with um, screws and bolts. Um, so it generally starts with an interest and with an interaction with the um, company and, the, and like the presence of surgeons who have been good role models and you say, look, I, I wouldn't mind hanging out with that person. I, don't, I, don't, I kind of don't mind doing what he does. Like that sounds pretty hands-on and interesting and you're helping people directly. So, um, And from that interest, then you say, well, how do I, how do, I do it? And in Australia, um, there's a good website which is called Becoming an Orthopedic Trainee on the AOA website, which is the Australian Orthopedic Association. It sort of outlines the steps for application um, and it also has a PDF that you can look up that goes through um, everything that you need to do to submit a full application and also what gets you points to um, have a more competitive application. So 
when I thought when I was kind of interested at the end of medical school and early um, you know, junior doctor years, I looked at PD, PDF up and I said, okay, I think I'm interested in this. I guess I'll start working towards that. So okay, I need to do um, these courses, which at the time were things like EMST, um, asset first sort of college run courses, um, as well as a couple of other things like certain particular terms like ED and um, doing time in orthopedics as, at a senior enough level. Um, and, and at the time, there was an anatomy requirement as well. So I sort of said, okay, well, I guess I'll start the ball rolling on these things and see where I end up. Um, so in your junior years, you can start working on those things. I know that the general surgical sciences examination, which is that part one sort of basic science examination of anatomy, pathology, um, physiology, is now something you can do pre-training. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about the pros and cons of that, but it's effectively made it a um, hurdle requirement before you apply. Um, and that's definitely something you can knock off um, after medical school and, and in the first um, you know, two or three years before you start thinking about applying. Um, our first part examination effectively is a multi-choice exam and it's based on a lot of knowledge um, and that knowledge is taken from some prescribed texts that are identified for you to study from. So um, it's fairly straightforward. It's a lot of time spent trying to learn all these very sometimes minutiae type facts um, and then be successful to pass that and it's not cheap either. Um, once you pass that, um, you often sort of PGY three or more, um, so third year after leaving medical school, you think, okay, I'm kind of ready to. Um, I've seen a few things. I've seen ED. I've seen a bit of other specialties, and I'm interested in orthopedics. That's when you stick your hand up and start applying for a job as an unaccredited registrar um, in Western Australia. It's called a service registrar, um, but it's basically a, a senior house officer or a resident uh, that now um, works as a registrar, and they are in a non-training position, but they're effectively doing a very similar role in some cases. Um, to the training registrar, whereby you're participating in on-call rosters, you're doing clinics, um, you're doing ward rounds, and you're doing, um, if, if, if you're fortunate enough, some theatre time as well. Um, and that's where you really get to see what the job is like as a registrar. And sometimes that's excellent. And you say, wow, this is like so much better because now I'm actually doing one, one specialty and I'm learning more about it and I'm becoming more confident um, and I'm able to manage um, decision-making a lot more easily. And some people say, look, this is like, it's probably the first time you're exposed to maybe longer hours and you're just like, man, this is crazy. I can't, I can't sustain this. I'm not going to do this for the next seven years. <laughs> I don't think this is for me. Um, and hours are definitely getting better um, and fewer and fewer people have re are feeling it that way. Um, and once you're an unaccredited registrar, then you, you start thinking really seriously about your application. So um, you treat every job like a job interview. You, you're trying to be – or you've got to be nice to everybody um, and pleasant. You've got to work hard. Um, and each – person you work with, that, that department's going to be a reference for, you, um, for your job application for a training position. Then you say, yep, I'm, I want to be a trainee. Um, um, the current system is that you have three application chances, um, and that's whether or not you get an interview, is my understanding. Um, and so that, that, that's a fairly stressful part of, of any unaccredited registrar's um, journey, I think. Um, and, yeah, it's, uh, yeah I, I couldn't imagine the the stress of that when I went through it wasn't it wasn't capped as yet. Um, and once you're on the training, it's like the greatest day of your life. You're so grateful you thank your parents and your spouses for like putting up with you, uh, worrying about it for so long. Um, and then all of a sudden you're on this conveyor belt that's got an exit and you gotta start thinking about um, you know what's happening next. So um, the steps of the AOA or the orthopedic training program now in Australia is an introductory period a core period and a transition to practice period. So they've moved away from a time-based program um, into one that's really um, competency and skills-based, um, and that's surgical and non-surgical skills like teamwork and communication and organisational skills. So um, the introductory um, section goes for one or two years or, or more, like it's, it's quite flexible and there's certainly uh, provisions there now to work part-time or have um, you know, um, childbearing duties and um, everything else considered for. And... Um, once you sort of tick those sort of boxes, which are mainly basic trauma procedures, you can move into the core period, which is where you try to focus on most of your core orthopedic learning. In that period, you're also expected to do your uh, fellowship examination. So it's no longer an exit exam, but it's an interning exam. Um, and you tick off what's called modules. So you have all these modules like spine and pathology and um, pediatrics and um, you know, hip, knee, shoulder, et cetera. And you've got to tick off um, competency in surgical skills as well as consulting skills and management plan formulation inside those. So there's about there's over 100 different things you need to sort of work on. Um, you need to pass all those modules, finish your fellowship exam um, to be allowed to enter the transition to practice um, module or stage. And that's really the last few years or one, one, one or two years where you're thinking, all right, 
what are my interests, um, where do I want to be, um, and how am I going to be as a surgeon? So you're kind of developing your own personality. Um, you're um, maybe finishing off your research requirement uh, for the training program, um, and you're perhaps um, requesting to go to hospitals where they've got a particular um, subspecialty interest that may be aligning with yours, or maybe you want to go to the country because you, that's general purpose for you and you're trying to see which country area might be a good fit with you. So, um, yeah, and, and this is all evolving at the moment. Like We're only just coming up to the first exiting group that are going through this program and um, the goalposts are changing as we develop it, make it better and work out how it's going to run. So it's an exciting time and orthopedics is certainly leading the way. Um, um, now, once you are into orthopedic training, obviously the next step, what you're looking at is fellowships. Uh, you know, everyone tries to plan their fellowships in advance. It's advisable to plan your fellowship in advance. Uh, what's your take on fellowships? When uh, do you think you will start planning your fellowship? Um, also, a little bit about research. Uh, how much research are you doing at the moment? And uh, what sort of research, um, you know, the most uh, trainees can look at doing during the training period? Um, if you can just highlight some of the aspects of that, it would be wonderful. Yeah, no worries, Nev. Um, two two massive topics like fellowship and research. And um, I'm a very organised person. I like planning. I like to know what I'm doing. And I like to plan things in the future to make sure things run smoothly. And fellowship is one of those things that's been pissing me off really because I've got absolutely no idea um, what I want to do in the future. I like I like a lot of things. Um, so that's one thing I've kind of just parked it for now and not really inquired or, or made any progress with. It bothers me deep down, but I'm, I'm okay with that because I really don't want to make headway on areas that I'm not sure I want to pursue in the future and I can't imagine what it would have been like organizing fellowships this year like I think this has been a crazy year and there's been a lot of people that have been grounded and had to be flexible and move things around and I really do feel for those um, you know, new consultants who you know they're obviously not handing out contracts in public hospitals and a lot of fellowships have either been canned international travel has been really challenging um, or the fellowships have been diluted because of coronavirus so um, yeah I couldn't imagine what it would be like to to be fellow this year and next year and I hope, hope the people are getting around it and making the most of the opportunities. Um, I think, yeah, how, how do you plan it? I think, I'm guessing, I, I'm obviously midway through my training or less. Um, I think you have, just want to start thinking as you do your uh, work as an unaccredited registrar or, or a pre-training registrar or a training registrar and think, um, what's this person's life like, this surgeon? And what is this part of the body like? Because most people end up Subspecialising, and it's probably something worth thinking about. Um, when I was a pre-training um, registrar in Perth, I spent some time with a couple of consultants um, on my days off, just to see what their rooms looked like, how their practice was set up, what a private list looked like. Um, and it is it's different between lower limb surgeons and upper limb surgeons and spine surgeons. So, um, just as being an intern in orthopedics is nothing like being a registrar in orthopedics, to a certain extent, being a registrar in orthopedics even isn't. That's similar to being a consultant orthopedics and choosing which especially works best with your personality and your lifestyle is probably an important step. So I'm still trying to spend time with surgeons and work out how does, what their setup look like, what's their weekly calendar seem like, you know, how often they're doing ward rounds. Is that because they're doing lots of lower limb stuff and they've got to go to different hospitals? Um, how do they manage their outpatients and their clinics? Um, and I'm, I'm going to try and use that to formulate where I sort of want to see myself as well as own my own intuitive interests in in specialties um and i suppose once you get your heart set on something then talk to people i think everyone that's been a fellowship is telling you to talk to people talk to people talk to people like talk to reps talk to surgeons talk to previously returned trainees from other fellowships talk to the fellows that are in your hospital because you might they might be a great connection to have to get to their hospital um talk to your surgeons that have been to other hospitals where did they go what was good what was bad can they put you in touch with someone who's been there recently um they're the real people you want to talk to. People who have just come back from a fellowship and say, hey, what was it really like? Was that hospital good? Did you get much operating time? Were the supervisors good? Um, or more important, you know, what was the travel like? Where did you live? Was it a good place to do stuff? Did it have good pubs? Um, some people say that the travel side of things is almost just as important as the, the orthopedic side of things. Um, and, you know, make sure you're talking. If you have a, a spouse that you live with or kids, make sure you factor in those people into your decision-making because, um, orthopedics is a long slog and fellowship is probably one of those opportunities I imagine where you can actually have, have a crack at um, having a bit of lifestyle and do a bit of travelling so I'm going to be trying to incorporate my wife and see whether she want to go and maybe she'll decide for me and, and the rest of the history um, I think after that you know you're going to work out and how to get a job back at home that sounds like it's 
um, even more of a challenge because ideally you, you start off with a public position as a minimum um, and that can be competitive. So I guess whichever public job you're doing as a registrar, don't forget that's a job interview for your future consultancy and um, make sure that you give it everything you got. Um, you're courteous, um, you're a good worker um, and you're respected by your colleagues and trying to get in fights. Um, Anton, that's been a uh, wonderful last one hour. Uh, I think we've covered so many topics, you know, uh, which are going to benefit the students, which are going to benefit uh, people who are looking to get into orthopedics. Uh, you know, what are the things that are required? Uh, how is the training, fellowship and research, and obviously, uh, you know, uh, study methodologies, and what are the new methods of learning that you are using uh, that you have found useful, and many of the students across the world have found useful. Um, uh, it's been fantastic having you here. Um, any final remarks you want to... Uh, no, thanks for having me, Nav. Um, great to be part of your channel. And um, yeah, I wish you all the best for the channel. And um, yeah, happy for anyone to reach out to me if they've got any questions um, about training and um, the processes in general. Um, and yeah, good luck to everyone.